Welcome to the Lift Every Voice podcast, where we explore books by contemplative writers of color. I'm Christine Walters Paintner. And I'm Claudia Love Meyer. We are joined each month by the author of our book club selection. Together, we explore how increasing our diversity of perspectives on contemplative practice can enrich our experience of the Christian mystical tradition. We encourage you to join us by reading the book, listening to the conversations, and engaging with the reflection questions on our website at abbeyofthearts.com. Welcome, everyone, to our Lift Every Voice book club podcast, and I am delighted, as always, to be joined by my co-host, Claudia Love Meyer. And this month, we have a special treat. We have Stephen Charleston joining us, who wrote this really beautiful book. We survived the end of the world, Lessons from Native America on Apocalypse and Hope. It's a very prescient book, very much for the times that we're in. Um, Stephen's a leading voice of justice for indigenous peoples, the environment, and spiritual renewal. He's a member of the Choctaw Nation, and he's appeared on ABC World News Tonight, BBC World News, and other outlets. He's the author of more than a dozen books on theology and spirituality, including Ladder to the Light. Uh, Charleston has served as the Episcopal Bishop of Alaska, President and Dean of the Episcopal Divinity School, and Professor of Systematic Theology at Luther Seminary. And he serves as a theolog theologian in residence at Berkeley Divinity School in Yale. Uh, Charleston lives with his wife, Susan, in Oklahoma. So welcome, Stephen. It's really wonderful to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Great. Um, Claudia Love, do you want to start us off? Yes, yes. Um, thank you for being here, Stephen. We're delighted to have you. Could you tell us about your life and your spiritual journey and share why you wrote this particular book at this particular time? I'll try and be brief about my spiritual journey because I think all of us are on a spiritual journey. And if you really look back over your shoulder and say, okay, can you describe what happened in 25 words or less? <laughs> no, it's it's volumes of experience and of encounters and gosh, just uh, miraculous uh, events. So it started, I guess it, I would say I started at four years old because I was uh, born in, in rural Oklahoma and into a large family where my great-grandfather, uh, who was still living, had a lot of the responsibilities for watching over me when I was little. And being uh, raised by him, he was a very spiritual person, not a, not a school-learned person, but a, but a grassroots spiritual person. And he taught me so much. He opened my mind up. He showed me things I could never have expected in this little farm we lived on on the edge of town. It was wonderful. And um, so it began there in childhood with an early fascination for everything sacred and holy. And my great-grandfather would read me Bible stories. And then when I asked him, why are you reading me all these Bible stories? He would say, because someday you'll grow up and be a preacher and you need to know this. So I felt as though I'd been sort of like all kids. If someone says you're going to be, when you grow up, you'll be a princess, you believe them, mm -hmm. you know, or you you could be an astronaut. You think, well, okay, I'll be an astronaut. So not to, not to overdo it, but to just say it started young and the rest of it is just playing that original impulse out throughout my entire life. Spiritually speaking, uh, I'm a mixture of things like most people. I think we all have different elements within us. And part of my journey has been influenced by all the different spiritual traditions, including those of my my Native American um, people. So it's been, I've continued this journey by going into a multicultural way of looking at faith and really opening myself up to as many different voices as I can. That's really interesting. A lot of us are kind of uh, intersectionalities in a in a human being, and mm -hmm. you know, let's say I have 
uh, African ancestry and Scottish ancestry and Irish ancestry and Swedish ancestry. And sometimes I find it confusing, uh, wondering what's, what's really mine. You know what I mean? Like when we have these beautiful conversations now about appropriating different spiritualities, you know, does just the African stuff belong to me because I'm more African than everything else? Um, I find it I find it an interesting conversation to have with myself and and a little challenging as well. Well, one way to look at it is to answer the question, who are my ancestors? I'm very big in talking to people about their ancestors, and it's not because uh, I'm thinking as an as an African American person, I have one ancestor that is Africa. It's got to be there somewhere. Your ancestors. I had someone once on uh, in a, in a dialogue I was having say that uh, they felt as though they didn't have any real ancestors. They didn't know who they were. Most of us, if we stop and think about it, our ancestors are that community to which we feel emotionally and spiritually we belong. And I said to him, he said, I, I was adopted. I have no ancestors. I don't know anything. But he was an artist. Mm. And I said, your ancestors are vast mm. and around the globe and throughout history. Men and women motivated by the desire to paint or to draw or to create. You have amazing ancestors. And, and it doesn't have to be relegated just to our uh, ethnic origins, which are usually mixed up anyway. Right. It really it really needs to be. Now, the issue is to do so appropriately without trying to uh, strip mine somebody else's culture to, to feed what, what we need. But to but to have this open where um, we can feel free to explore other traditions um, and learn from them, because if we yeah. don't explore them, we don't learn anything. We just keep repeating what we've grown up with so that our spiritual life stalls somewhere around age 10. Yes, yes. And I think we need to do that with a, a big old heaping dose of humility and love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And respect mm -hmm. and willingness to, to know that that message you're trying to glean from another culture may not be the message you want to hear. Mm -hmm. uh, there may be some critique there of where you're coming from, of your position. And you have to be ready for that and accepting of that if you really, truly want to enter into a broader dialogue. I think you asked me, why did I write the book at this time? I didn't want to lose that question because it's because we, I, I don't know. I All of the books I've done are in many ways sort of motivated from some spiritual place that that just speaks to me. And, and in this case, it was just so many people are worried and anxious and fearful these days. I mean, we really are at a global turning point. And I don't know if my books will help people or how much they will help people, but if they can help at all, it's incumbent upon me to speak up and try and offer something to help people through this difficult time and to reassure them we'll make it. We can do this. And, and the spirit is with us. We don't have to be afraid. Mm -hmm. We don't ever have to be afraid. We need to stand up and be counted. Now's our moment. We're here for a reason. There's a purpose for this. It's not by accident. We didn't ask to be born into interesting times like this. We didn't ask to be at a hinge point of history, but we're there. And we're there because the spirit wants us to do something collectively as a people, change our history, create a future. Yeah, all of that. That's why I wrote it. Mm -hmm. I love the, the words that stand out to me most is, if I can help at all. I love that. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. You know, in the introduction, you say that your book grew from the seed of an idea that people can survive an apocalypse. And I loved this phrase, not the grim survival of bunkers and bomb shelters, but the liberating and hopeful survivor survival of a spiritual community, which I think, you know, it just points the way to something so much different than what we often hear about when we hear about apocalypse and end times, particularly in more kind of fundamentalist traditions. So can you tell us a little bit about 
sort of how this image of apocalypse kind of planted a seed in you and how you felt that direction towards that more hopeful way of being. I think if I look back on it, I think one of the places where the idea for this book started was I overheard a conversation, uh, which is pretty typical these days, where somebody was saying that uh, everything was so bad in the world and in, in the world around us and in our country, and and uh, there was so much hate and war and violence and fear that it, it, it was like, it feels like the end of the world. And they're scared. I don't know what the future is, but it feels like the end of the world. And it made me realize when I heard that, I thought, well, my ancestors lived through the end of the world. If you look back, I'm a Chata, uh, Chata and the Choctaw, and the Choctaw people are from around current day Mississippi, parts of Louisiana, Alabama. That was our homeland, Chata Yakne, the Chata homeland. And, and in that space, when we were there uh, in the 1830s, we were forced out of our homeland on the Trail of Tears. Now you have to just, I don't want to, I'm not going to get the violin out and play the sad music to go with this, this horrible story. It's one example of colonialism and not the only one, but my own people, this is my personal experience. Uh, we had everything taken away, lost everything, homes, land, language, religion, way of making a living, um, political freedom, you name it, it was gone, obliterated. Try and imagine that in terms of our own country. If within a very short amount of time, one or two years, everything started collapsing really big time, that there was there was just uh, some overwhelming tsunami of, of cultural change and oppression that came over your people that they they were just literally wiped off the map. That's what my ancestors survived. Um, the racism, the bigotry, the prejudice, the violence, the anger, the everything. They survived all of that, force marched in the winter, walking with babies and with old people through the snow, where about uh, a fourth of the people died. When we arrived in Oklahoma, our new land, uh, we had no way of knowing how we had, what we what to expect. We only knew that we had come through something horrific. How did we do that? Why didn't we die? Why wasn't our culture destroyed? Why are we still able to speak our language? What was it within the Chata people that allowed them to survive the end of the world? If I could express that somehow, then these men and women who are asking that question would have an answer. They did it this way. They did it because of what they believed in, what they had faith in spirituality turned out to be an answer to the apocalypse. And apocalypse is a big word, as I try to say in the book. Uh, we can all have a personal apocalypse. When you get a, a cancer diagnosis, you're in the moment of apocalypse. It, it is, it is a, a paradigm shift in your reality. We, we feel that individually, collectively, as cultures, as communities, uh, as nations, as the world. And and that apocalypse can be uh, an event, like a volcano blowing up. Uh, it can also be, uh, but it can also be something else. And we need to remember that. Apocalypse is a revelation. In Greek, it means to reveal something, to show something. You discover something. The apocalypse for us can be also a breaking open, an opportunity to move through. It can be a threshold to another reality. The prophets and the sages and the, and the mystics who talked about the transformation of the world would talk about it in that way, that it is it is a paradigm shift, yes, fraught with danger and challenge, yes, but going somewhere positive, but leading somewhere we have to go through this to get there. Civil rights is an example in this country. We had to go through and are still going through what we need to go through. We cannot turn away, look away, pretend it's not still a relevant issue. It is an apocalyptic issue. Uh, race and violence and war and the treatment of other human beings, these are all apocalyptic issues because they not only threaten us, but they reveal something to us. And if we have the willingness to move toward what they're showing us and to pass through that, it would be like my ancestors. We'll walk through the snow and come out on the other side. 
Yeah, I I find that so remarkable, especially because of how horrific it was, and that you're able to to glean the wisdom from that suffering and not have it turn to bitterness, but to have it to turn into something hopeful, not only for you, but to then offer that to the wider community is just a remarkable gift. Because I think so many people are mired in bitterness and resentment, even if they haven't experienced such a complete world shattering, you know, event like that in their- Yes, that's history. very well said. And that's part of the, uh, the need is the people that are stuck in that tar pit of anger where they can't move because they're just completely encased in their anger toward each other. It's so common today, and yet it's exactly what we need to come up against and free people from their own prejudices and their own fears and, and conspiracies and and all of that. And uh, we need to face it and, and talk about it honestly, but with a sense of hope because my ancestors are uh, have shown the way uh, others have shown the way uh, we we can we can change this if we have the will to do it mm -hmm. thank you for that yeah you chose four prophets and a specific ethnic group for their wisdom to share could you tell us why you made those choices out of all the possibilities available yeah that sure that's a great question i i would say First of all, it was simply a matter of um, realizing that there are some topics so big that if you don't find a way to compress it down to where people can manage manage it and, and you'll be writing forever, first of all, you'll never finish because there's always another prophet or another tradition or another thing to say. So I tried to, to limit myself to those most powerful answers to me or... or ways of, of understanding of apocalypse and prophecy. And so I chose to limit it. Uh, four is a sacred number for our people. So I tried to look at a, a smaller number in that case. And in, in particular, I was looking uh, at prophets that had uh, spoken and, and been at particularly pivotal moments, at really a pivotal moment. The um, the role of the Six Nations in upstate New York at the moment that the prophecy was occurring was really a pivotal moment in American history and in European history, in global history. Um, and those people were uh, of the Six Nations were right there, the Seneca and the Cayuga and the Mohawk and the Onondaga. They were right there at the epicenter of this shift. Um, and they were a powerful force. In, in a powerful player in that moment of history. So to see this amazing culture, which had created an egalitarian form of life that was so persuasive it was used as a template for the United States Constitution, the, the great law of peace, which the Six Nations lived under, was such a sophisticated and egalitarian uh, way of envisioning the world. It struck me that when it collapsed, literally began to fall apart within within a few years, what the heck was going on there? And what was this voice, this strange voice crying out in the midst of it to, to find a new way, uh, to take the old traditions and reinterpret them in a way that revitalized them and allowed the people to survive literally a physical apocalypse that is their own genocide and so i look for people like that or for the the voice that came out the prophet that arose during the time of tecumseh when the the native nations were right on the verge of forming a united uh nations of indian and indigenous people to stand against the settlers how different the world would have been had that vision been lived out how what would have happened the voice that of the prophet at that moment seemed to me to be very very inspirational and important well the others were the same way um the other prophets i chose and the hopi were that way I, I i would say in every case i used i tried to to find 
what was the authentic voice of this prophecy? What was this person or these people trying to tell us? And not to color code it in any way, but to simply allow it to come in and to, and to understand what they I thought they were trying to say in a contemporary context. That is, what do we today living in this the world we're in, what do we have to learn from these sources about survival? Thank you. That's amazing. Yeah, I think one of the things I was so struck by in reading your book was how how little I, as a an American in you know the school system, would ever have learned these stories, and what a what a gift it is to have you know this as a source of wisdom that you offer to us, and that sort of the translation of it for for our times. One of the things I was kind of struck by, and I just wanted to have you explore a little bit, was that two of the, the first two of the prophets had these visions from their sickbed that were so powerful and potent that they changed the whole community, and their families even thought that they had died. Um, and so I wondered about the significance of these dreams emerging from these places of radical vulnerability and, you know, even touching the that threshold between life and death. And particularly for myself, I'm very drawn to medieval European women mystics, who many of whom had visions and many of whom had these, you know, experiences of severe illness and even almost death. And I'm just curious your take on what is it about that place of vulnerability that can bring forth this really transformational um, possibilities for the community? Well, first of all, I'd say it's really helpful to all of us, the vast number of us out here who haven't thought of ourselves as being all that prophetic or, you know, I'm not a great seer or mystic. I don't pretend to be a medicine person. I don't, I don't ever try and fool people that all you're hearing is what I have to say as an individual. I don't speak for all Native people. I don't speak for my own tradition. The, the Chata Nation speaks for itself. So what? And and so, the other part of that is I'm I have flaws and things about myself and my history and my personality that um, are difficult and conflicted. Uh, I've made mistakes in my life. All of that. So I think it's helpful for us to confront the fact that, for example, in this first two examples. You have very flawed and, uh, and, and fragmented people in the case of these two prophets, uh, both of whom had trouble with alcoholism and they were depressed and they had suffered like a lot of modern people are suffering. And so the source of prophecy doesn't come necessarily from the, uh, the sound of music, from the, from the sort of beautiful image of the perfect believer who is so, so angelic. No, these are, these men were were tough and tumble and uh, in trouble a lot kind of guys who almost died. That transition from from death to life that is very much a part of many prophetic traditions in Africa, in Asia, in in other parts of Europe. You'll find stories like that where people thought they were dying and they lived to tell their tale. It's very important in most native indigenous traditions in Turtle Island that people would see life like that, that their great mystics or seers would be people who had literally felt they'd gone to heaven or gone to the other world or seen the other world. So it's very quite quite common. And these, these two traditions that spoke of it would not have been unusual. Many, it's interesting, many of our spiritual, great spiritual leaders have started out sometimes in very different places than where they wound up. And that's the message of hope for all of us. We're all able to become prophets. There's nothing about it that is so supernatural that you as a human being cannot reach into yourself and find the, the message that God is giving you or the spirit is giving you or however you understand the divine and that it's helping you to be the best person you can be to do the job you need to do to, to affect the world. Mm, thank you for that. I love that. Um, it's very empowering and hope filled to um, to think that these prophets have always been have so often been called from the most humble or broken or vulnerable of circumstances. So 
they give a, a lot of hope. <laughs> sure. And look at your podcast. Look at look at what you do. What you're doing is, in fact, that same kind of prophetic work. It is trying mm -hmm. to get people to hear one another. It's not that you can walk on water. Uh, if you could, we'd all be in a better place because you could change it with a snap of your fingers, but you can't. All you can do is whatever the gift the Spirit has given to you. And for both of you, the gift has been given and you're using it. And it's working and people are listening and they're talking and they're gaining knowledge. You're, you're a marketplace for new ideas. Um, all of us have something we're doing or could do that is, in that sense, prophetic, life-changing, revelatory, opening doors, opening minds, opening hearts, opening hands all part of the prophetic process and that's what that's what and those of us who do it do it intentionally that's the key part of it all we're trying to do is to come to an awareness of why we wow and why we were called to be who we are mm -hmm. thank you so much for that yeah i think this is a good transition into my question um, Stephen, on page 80 you were talking about your social media presence and you said my message was like the prophet's teaching, a call for peace, love, and justice. Like the prophet, my goal was to unite people of many different backgrounds, like, and please forgive me for however I wreck this name, like Tenskwata, Tenskwata, I, let me, let me try it again. Tenskwatawa? Tenskwatawa. Tenskwatawa. See, I, when I heard it, I could say it. <laughs> Tenskwatawa, like Tenskwatawa, I welcomed people to follow the traditions of their ancestors, but to do so in community with others from all walks of life. Why are those two things, following the traditions of one's ancestors and being in community with diverse groups of people so important? Perhaps one of the first spiritual awarenesses that human beings came to uh, other than the impulse to bury their dead hundreds of thousands of years ago was some innate sense within ourselves that uh, that we were all able to see things in a in a in a different way um i think what we what we face here is an opportunity for us to find an expression within ourselves that's authentic to ourselves, but that also is open to other people. We're all caught between the past and the future. The present is a waiting room between the past and the future. We've come this far, we're going somewhere else. Knowing your tradition and knowing your vision are the bookends of a spiritual life. You need both of them. The elders would say, you must be able to understand the tradition because it is an embodiment of who we are, what brought us to this point, how we lived, how we survived, how we have faith. The people also need vision. You have to know you're going somewhere and that there's something else out there for you to achieve or to find or discover. And you can't do it alone. That's a key thing because you never you have part of a tradition I have the Chata tradition. Do I do I know what the Zambezi tradition was or the, the Maori tradition was or what the Chinese tradition? Unless I have some sense in which I'm in communi community with other voices and other traditions, my vision of the future will be narrow. If I only look at one tradition, I'm only going to listen to Christians. I'm not listening to nobody else but Christians. Well, you've just shut your ears, mind, and heart to millions and billions of people can't do that not if you're professing that this is going to be life-changing for everyone on the planet or that it's love because love is universal mm -hmm. so you have to somehow be able to know your tradition to honor your ancestors to value where you came from and to be respectful of that or uh, on the other hand you have to do the same energy in, in the job of looking to the future and envisioning and when it comes to envisioning i'm not saying that um, it has to be some technicolor vision or dream on the hilltop. 
it's very much a revealing, a, an unpeeling of the layers of your life like an onion as you discover different things about yourself and about others as you relate to them. And you come to a place of self-discovery. Um, and from that source, you begin to see the visions around you that, that you're meant to see. This Does is that so help? Oh, yeah, yeah, this is so good. I, I can't believe how privileged I am to be part of these conversations. Thank you, Stephen. Thank no, you. you <laughs> yeah, I, one of the things that you say in the book is that the that really struck me because I wholeheartedly agree is that the key to stopping the environmental apocalypse is not science, but love. And I uh, well, of course, the the wisdom and knowledge of science is really important. I don't think we're going to ever think our way out of the situation we're in, but the embodiment of love is such a key part of this. But I wanted to ask you about the Genesis Covenant, because this is one of your own prophetic acts in the world. And if you could share a little bit more about what um, what that vision is about for you and what you're hoping for with that. It makes me laugh because the Genesis covenant is a good example of how prophecies don't always work and turn out the way you want them to. Um, that's an important lesson to learn in the humility of my life when I I am very self-revealing. I don't think of myself as some um, great intellectual or spiritual leader or anything. Uh, and the Genesis covenant is an example because it was an idea I had that was from the heart that I felt was right. And I, I took the gamble. I got up and said it out loud in front of thousands of people. And I and I tried my best to make it happen, and it didn't work. Um, the Genesis Covenant, in short, was the idea, this was many years ago, that as we were coming into an awareness of the uh, apocalypse of our environment, that uh, if we could rally the spiritual people uh, much less the politicians, the corporate leaders, the academics, the you know all those people that have power. But could we could we at least pull together uh, all the spiritual people? So I had the idea that you would imagine on a stage would be the Dalai Lama and the Pope and the head of the Southern Baptist Convention and the Assemblies of God and uh, people from Saudi Arabia representing Islam and. Um, Gosh, everybody that was anybody in spirituality, and they were all standing there together, arm in arm, saying, we're in this together. We're going to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We're going to protect our Mother Earth from destruction. And whatever storyline was going on, the global media would be showing pictures of this and phenomenal gathering of spiritual people, all saying the same message all just saying one thing, we're in this together. We are united in doing something about this for our children. And what a tremendous change that would have made. How industry, it, corporate people would be climbing over each other to be associated with it because it's good for business. Politicians would be enacting things and making it happen because it was good for their electoral base. Um, countries would think it was amazing that they were getting along on something when they assume that we don't get along on anything like between Russia and the United States. They would be cooperating to do one thing, and the head of the Russian church would be standing next to a Buddhist teacher, and they're both saying the same thing. Well, I won't see I'm excited again. And I got up with that same energy and excitement. I still feel it. It's still there. And I tried to get everybody <laughs> to, to agree with me and to do this thing, and uh, it just didn't go anywhere. Everybody was doing their own thing in those days. Everybody had a little office for environmental work for the Methodists and the Presbyterians and the Universal, I don't know. But I couldn't get people to get together and do it together. And I think we missed an opportunity. And I think that image I created of all those people up there together would have then moved beyond the environment of, of the earth and talked about the human environment of how we treat one another. Because if we could all get on stage to do that, could we all get on stage to feed everybody? Could we all get on stage to, uh, you know, do something like end um, the abuse of women? Yeah, we just did it. <laughs> we could do it again. 
We could yeah. cooperate. We could be united. We could love together. We could have faith lead the way somewhere for a change instead of running after science saying we're important too. Yeah. 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 Thank but it didn't you, work. Kayla. And I learned from that. I'm not yeah. God. I'm not the emissary of the divine. I am Steve. I tried. And uh, I'm still trying. I'm trying something different. And I think for me, though, what, I love that story. And I appreciate you sharing that. I love that. First of all, that, you know, it, it speaks to what you were saying, like, we're, we're all called to offer a vision. And not all the visions will necessarily take fruition. And like, I was so excited when I read about that in your book, too. And I thought, gosh, there, there are definitely seeds planted by that vision that you you can't see, do you know what I mean? And you may not even see in your lifetime, but to act in that kind of faith and hope is a really beautiful thing. So thank you for that. Welcome. Yeah, I agree. There are seeds, you know, that we're the 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 root and the and the and the stalks and the flowers of seeds planted ages ago, uh, the work that we're doing right now. So I felt the spirit when you talked about that, you know. I think it shall be one day. It just I might. do too. Yeah. I do too. I think you're right. I it's you learn a sense, I guess, as you get older. Maybe part of it's I'm getting older. So, you know, I uh I realize I'm not gonna be around to see everything I hoped I'd see. And mm -hmm. uh, and I'm disappointed to see what I am seeing. You know, I thought we'd come a little further than we have in some areas. We'd have to be doing this again. You know, I feel like I, I, and when I was in my 20s, uh, I had a strong heart for justice, and I still do in my 70s, and mm -hmm. I will as long as I'm here. But uh, it's, <laughs> it's a little different when you're older because you see how no, so many of the other options people use don't work. Mm -hmm. It's not getting anywhere to name call people, to exclude people, to live in little private bunkers of privilege, uh, all that stuff to be afraid of other people, mm -hmm. um, to believe half the nonsense we hear, mm -hmm. really. All so the power it, it, Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there, there are voices in the wilderness, for sure. There's a quality about being prophetic in that sense, that you have to be prepared to be out there alone sometimes with just an echo of your own voice. Like, well, everybody, are we going to do this? Anybody? But you keep doing it. You have to stand true to your principles and keep doing it. Amen to that. Tell us about the ghost dance, what it whispered to you, and what it means for Apocalypse. The ghost dance was a phenomenon that emerged really at what has often been described as the end of the Old West. It was in the 1890s. And by that point, the map of America had been largely drawn to um, contain and exclude Native people. And so the, um, the triumph of colonialism and of manifest destiny, of the march to the Pacific by the, uh, the colonizers, the settlers, had been largely accomplished. Native nations were reduced in size and number and mostly herded into smaller little areas of reservations. During that time, a phenomenon occurred in which a man named Wovoka in Nevada, a Paiute Indian man, had a vision. And as so often happens in Native tradition, uh, we live out our spirituality in dance. That's a difference between us and lots of other people, but it's a unique quality of ours that we, we often dance to, to represent a spiritual feeling. And uh, so to create a dance was not unknown but Wavoka created a new dance based on his vision of the afterlife where he saw in a time when he went into a, into a catatonic state, he saw the future and he saw heaven and he saw what would happen. And um, the ghost dance was a way to hurry that vision into the world. It was a way to share that vision with other people in order to, so we were all dancing together, that what we were dancing for was Wovoka's vision of the unity of humanity under peace and equality and the just treatment of Mother Earth. 
to dance any native person or indigenous person would join and i think many non-natives would join such a dance like that to say i'll and to dance is to stand up and show respect to move with your contemporaries to be at one and moving with your peers in spiritual synchronicity and so to me the ghost dance whispered it's not over it's not over and that message has been so helpful to me because like any other human being i'm quick quick to throw in the towel and say well that's it it'll never happen now nobody's ever going to do that it'll never there'll never be and and by being the king of never no nope, never going to happen never going to see it never going to do it uh, you don't you don't see it or do it and so i think the message of the ghost dance was a mystical message that the dance of the people goes on even if it is obscured by something as dreadful as the the action of wounded knee where a, a group of native people were massacred in near wounded knee south dakota and they were they were massacred because they were dancers because they were dancing with Oka's dance they were old people and and children and women and they didn't have any guns and you know they weren't going to be a threat to anybody but they were gunned down by the seventh cavalry who had the honor of taking them out to redo what happened to custer so they got to kill these women and children in order to make up for their loss to to native american men so there's something in the ghost dance that's powerful and dark and sad and yet enriching and ennobling because it comes from a vision of an entirely different world than the one that took it down so when i dance with Vavoka, i dance the ghost dance because i'm remembering my ancestors i'm remembering those who died in the snow thank you for sharing, you for sharing. yeah that's really beautiful and it, it actually makes me wonder um we only have a, a few more minutes left but i wanted to ask you what is it that sustains you, you know, because you're, you're fit, you know, you're leaning into such difficult stories and our current story is so challenging. And what are the things that sustain you in maintaining a hopeful vision for where we're, we're going? Are the, the, I'm thinking of, are there practices like the dance? Are there other practices that help keep you going and feeling a connection to that hope yes there are practices that help me and um and that uh like uh, like most folks they have rituals or practices that that are supportive meditation is one for me um it has always been um important part of my life and and i'm very grateful to buddhism because of its introduction to a style of meditation and understanding of meditation that i think is helpful to all of us and um what has sustained me from those meditative moments that i have is the vision that i see and what i know will come and what one day we will be like and I realize that this is only another turning point moving in that direction, if we let it be. And that the more that I can put my shoulder against the wheel to push us in the direction that I see as healing for us, the, the more I'll try until my last breath to, for it to happen, because I've seen it and I've been there. Like mm -hmm. Wavoka, uh, like Tenskwatawa, like any of the other native indigenous prophets, I'm not shy about saying I've seen visions. Um, one of the unusual things about Native people is they would paint their visions on the outside of their houses so everybody could walk in by would notice it. So on your teepee, there would be images or dreams that you had, or you would change your name when you woke up from a dream because you had seen something different. Or now you were older, so we were going to call you a different name because now you're more experienced and you embody a vision vision is so powerful what do you see i ask people what do you see i see another time in to come when human beings will be a family that's unimaginable now 
but it's not so hard to achieve. It's really not. We all love our grandchildren. We all love our children. We all want to be loved. It's not so hard if we choose to do it. And someday we will. And the earth will not be abused anymore. And human beings will not be exploited anymore. And everyone will have something to eat and uh, a safe place to sleep. And it will happen. And I've seen it, and I've seen the joy of it, and the liberation of it, and how it opens us up to become something new that we never imagined, that we are human beings, that we were meant for this. And it will change us spiritually, and it will change us politically and economically too. It'll change us up one side and down the other, and it will happen. And I believe it, and because I believe it, it will happen because I will not relent and send forward into the future. When I become an ancestor, you'll still hear me talking about this. <laughs> I love it. I absolutely love that. And the, the, you know, just what you were saying earlier about the ancestors and the vision, you know, holding that tension between the memory and the possibility is exquisite and, um, Anyway, thank you. I think that's a, a beautiful place for us to to end on. Um, I just wondered, as a last little side note, is are you working on anything right now in terms of a writing project? Uh, yes. <laughs> anything you'd want to share? Just curious. No, <laughs> like, no, no. I, you know, I, I've had some wonderful books come out recently. Um, mm -hmm. Ladder to the Light, uh, the Spirit Wheel, and now this one. Um, my earlier book, uh, the four vision quest of Jesus, it's still going. I 20, 15, 20 years. I don't know. It's been a long time still in print. So I, I know myself as a writer that a lot of times it's when I, when the spirit kind of finally gets me to sit down and start the process, something will happen. So I'll keep you posted, but thank you for asking. And thank you for letting me be with the two of you on this and all the people who listen and see it. I'm so honored. Thank you very much. I don't never take it for granted. I'm no big shot when it comes to spirituality. I'm just here and I'm still amazed when people ask me for my opinions, but thank you. That was great. Thank you, Stephen. The, the book is We Survived the End of the World, Lessons from Native America on Apocalypse and Hope. It's a really powerful book on so many levels. I'm so grateful to you for writing it and for joining us, Stephen. It's been just a delight to have you here. Thank you. Absolutely.